So good afternoon to one and all. I'm Dr. Prashant Putran, consultant interventional pain physician currently at Elevate Pain Clinics, Bangalore. So regarding today's topic, that is basics of ultrasound and its clinical significance. So in the current era, we all know that we are using ultrasound in our day-to-day -day practice. All the more because we are trying to increase our precision to provide safety to our patients. So it is important for us to know certain basics involved in this particular machine while you're scanning the patient so that ultimately it helps you to get a good image and do our techniques in the precise manner. And as I said earlier, which mutually benefits the patient and us as well as practitioners. So let's get on with it. So I'll be dealing with the introduction, the history, the principle involved in the production of these ultrasound waves, the image, the properties of the ultrasound wave, the ultrasound tissue interactions, so what happens when these waves interact with the body tissues, and the different modes of imaging, and the most importantly, the artifacts, and also the knobology. There is basically the knobs, the switches, or the buttons, what do you see on our ultrasound machines, so that you have a fair understanding of what uh, to use to finally optimize our image in order to do it, in order to do the procedures or scan the particular area of interest with great precision. So the ultrasound scan is also called as a sonogram or diagnostic sonography or an ultrasonography. So basically ultrasound scan is a device that uses sound waves to create an image of some part of the body, such as the stomach, liver, heart, tendons, muscles, joints, nerves, and blood vessels. So basically depending on the area of which we are scanning, all right? So we are using the sound waves. So sound, as we know, is a mechanical wave that travels in a straight line. Series of, it includes series of pressure waves propagating through a particular medium, okay? So it includes this areas of compressions and compressions of rarefactions. Basically at this level, it is very compressed. And at, at this level, the, the wave is, has a lot of rarefactions, okay? So the pressure is maximum over here and the pressure is minimum at this place. So today's topic, there'll be a lot of physics involved. Okay, so the terminologies also will be a little, maybe a bit unheard of. So I'll try to simplify things as much as possible. Okay. So to give an example from nature, you know that the bat, so it's, though it's blind, but it travels with the help of this technology, it uses this technology in a way that it emits sound waves and then it, the, it receives the reflected waves and based on that, it plans its trajectory or the travel, okay? So this kind of principle is already being used in nature. So coming to the various uh, properties of sound, like the different kinds of sound, there is an audible range of sound, which is uh, from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, all right? So anything beyond that is called as ultrasound, that is over 20,000 hertz, and anything below 20 hertz is called as the infrasound, okay? So the human audible range is between 20 to 20,000 hertz. So that means the ultrasound waves what we use, it is not audible to humans, okay? And that is particularly used in nature with by these bats. That is how they are uh, planning their uh, trajectory or navigating through the uh, in the night when they are not able to see things, right? So with the help of this, so how they are able to do that? So coming to the history of the usage of ultrasound waves in our clinical practice starts way back at 
in the in the year in the year 1880, where Pierre and Jacques Curie first discovered these crystals called as the piezoelectric crystals. So, what are these piezoelectric crystals? We'll come to know very soon. So, again, ultrasound was used by the Navy as a sonar in detecting submarines and detecting other projectile missiles. In 20, Paul Langevin discovers that the high power ultrasound can generate heat in osseous tissues and disrupt animal tissues. So, is that happening in our day to day practice? Let's find out. All right, in the consecutive slides. Carl and Dusik described the ultrasound used as a diagnostic tool, and it was also used to treat patients with Meniere's disease, Parkinson's disease, and rheumatic arthritis. So this was the sonar system, which had a source which emitted the sound waves, and then there was an array to receive these sound, reflected sound waves from the target. So that is how they could map out where the submarines used to be located. Okay. So in 1978, Lagrange published the first case series of ultrasound application for placement of needles for nerve blocks. So here we are getting into more of a clinical practice. And uh, P. Ting and we, Shiva Nangaratan, used ultrasonography to demonstrate the anatomy of the axilla and to observe the spread of local anesthetics during axillary block. And 1994, Stephen Capral and his colleagues explored brachial plexus blockade using B mode ultrasound. Okay, so we did speak about something called as a piezoelectric crystal. So now, what is this piezoelectric effect? Okay, also called as the Pierre Curie Jacques Curie effect, is the ability of certain materials to generate an electric charge in response to applied mechanical stress. So you apply certain mechanical stress to certain kind of materials and as a response to that, they will be able to generate an electric charge. So this is the piezoelectric effect. So now what is reverse piezoelectric effect? The, the reverse of that. So that is the electrical stimulation causes mechanical distortion of the crystals resulting in vibration and production of sound waves. Okay. So let us see how it actually happens in the that little transducer what we use to scan the patients. So what are those crystals, first of all? So there are various naturally occurring crystals like quartz, berlinite, sucrose, topaz. But most importantly, what you can see is the synthetic ceramics like lead, zirconate, titanate. This particular crystal is used in our clinical practice, it is used in the transducer to produce this particular ultrasound waves. Okay, let's look at this. Look at this picture. Okay, so there is a piezoelectric element in the center, and what happens when it vibrates? So the piezoelectric element vibrates to generate a sound wave, and then when when applied with a voltage, so there is a current source. So when a current source is applied to a piezoelectric element, it is producing these sound waves, all right? So what happens in the reverse order? The piezoelectric element generates a voltage when applied with vibration. That is the mechanical stress. So you apply mechanical stress to the element, it will produce a electrical, it will produce a voltage, a electrical current. So this is the reverse piezoelectric effect. And this is the, the on the left-hand corner, it is the piezoelectric effect, all right? Each piezoelectric crystal produces an ultrasound wave, okay? So summation of all the waves of all those crystals is the final product is the ultrasound beam, okay? And the ultrasound waves, they are generated in pulses, okay? So the pulse length is obviously the distance between the uh, distance traveled by the each pulse. Okay. So pulse repetition frequency is a rate of pulses emitted by the transducer. So that is what is determined by the number what you have. So the number of pulses what is generated in unit time. Let's see what is that unit time. So before that, let's just look into the ultrasound probe. Okay. So this is a cut section of the 
common transducer what we use so we can see the most important element over here is this the, the light the one in light blue color which is the array of the piezoelectric crystals okay and we need to apply an electrical current to them so obviously they are surrounded by electrodes which uh, which uh, supply this alternating potential difference nothing but the voltage okay so as it is true with any energy which is produced it has to be contained within that particular device right so that is why you have the acoustic insulator and the metal outer casing and the backing block okay and of course the plastic nose to help us in the smooth uh, process of scanning okay so a little bit in detail about the transducer especially about the tip portion where you have this you can see the array of crystals which is uh, covered by an acoustic matching layer okay all these things will be explained in the new slides okay and then the backing material and then the uh, acoustic lens which is used which is used to magnify the uh, the sound waves which is produced okay so below we have another cut section with, uh, describing the similar things which i already explained right so moving on okay so in this picture this is the array of piezoelectric crystals okay so again what happens when the electric uh, when there is the sound waves which is so there are two processes there is production of the wave and there is reflection of the wave so there is production and reception what is happening so during the reception you see that this voltage meter has detected a electrical current right so that is the what is happening the mechanical stress that is the reflected sound waves that is the mechanical stress on these piezoelectric crystals is generating a current right so that is the piezoelectric effect right so the initially it starts off as the reverse piezoelectric effect and then becomes the piezoelectric effect to finally produce the image so now how the image is produced so so far we know that the crystals are under stress so the crystals generate the sound waves then it is reflected by the source or by the particular organ which is displayed here and then when it comes back and produces a stress an electrical current is produced so then how do we get the image okay so this is the algorithm which is used that you know to just a brief idea to get a brief idea how the image is displayed in te very technical terms the pulse which is transmitted scattered by the sound by the tissue then there is reception then there is beam formation then there is processing 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 right finally there is a scan conversion post processing you get the image display so that means the uh, the processor the image processor which is innate in the machine is very important so that finally we, we get the electrical current finally which is displayed as a proper display of the anatomical structures which we are interested in right so uh, this is quite a uh, shocking number actually this process of transmission reception can be repeated over 7000 times a second okay so when coupled to computer processing will result in the generation of the real time 2d image what we see okay so the the process of this uh, transmission and reception is occurring 7000 times per second all right so that is uh, the number produced by each crystal okay so that is why we have array of crystals which finally when combined everything will give you that proper image the display which is of the targeted organ in this picture you can see that it is the uh, the morphology of the kidney what is displayed over here finally right so the similar things we used in the radar also okay in the radar system that finally this particular signaling with the help of gps that will be displayed as they will be displayed as dots on the radar scan over here so that you can know the distance between the aircraft so this is what is done in the atc it's similar to the principle what is used in the ultrasound okay so the components of the ultrasound scanner the pulser that applies the high amplitude voltage to energize the crystals the transducer that converts that electrical energy to mechanical ultrasound energy and vice versa 
all right so when the reflected waves comes the waves the mechanical energy is converted into electrical energy so that's why it's called as a transducer then there's a receiver which detects and amplifies weak signals the importance of this you will come to know in the further slides then of course the display which displays the ultrasound signals in variety of modes and then the memory storage capacity to store whatever the uh, video is displayed or the image which is displayed okay so coming to the hardcore properties of ultrasound of an ultrasound wave so we have three important things that is the frequency wavelength and velocity so frequency is the number of complete cycles per second so which uh, translates that 1 hertz so commonly you have seen the uh, the designation as hertz or mhz right so 1 hertz equals to 1 cycle per second so the frequency range what we commonly use in our transducers can be from 2 to 20 megahertz okay so this will be the low frequency what you are starting with and this will be the highest frequency which you end up with so the transducers what we have have varied uh, are in this varied frequency ranges and let's see how they are different and how they are applicable in our clinical setting all right and what is the physics involved behind that okay so to start off frequency and wavelength they are universally proportional okay may not have clinical significance but i am very important to understand certain facts okay so lower the frequency the wavelength will be obviously higher okay higher the penetration but lower the resolution this is a very very important slide and very important thing to remember that when you when there is a frequency is low the penetration is high but the resolution is low so we are kind of uh when we use the low frequency probe the frequency is low but the penetration is better but the resolution the way we see the structures is a little lower in resolution right so what is important there for us is penetration depth is important so to go to to scan deeper structures we have to use the lower frequency that is what it says but as a clinician and when you are trying to achieve precision all right so resolution is important because it is very important to see the structures where we are intending to do other certain procedures or needling procedures right a tip of the needle per se right so that is achieved in a higher frequency so in a higher frequency the the resolution is very detailed but the penetration is poor okay so this helps us to choose based on the depth of our intended target okay so if it is in the if it is beyond 4 the target is 4 if it's beyond 4 cm it is advised that we go go with the lower frequency probes and what are they we will come to know Where, and if it is in the superficial structure we will go with the higher frequency probe because they are, the resolution is better and the way we see it on displays all is similar to the anatomical description of the structure okay which makes our job very easier so this is the resolution portion that when there is high frequency see at the intended portion there are two structures at uh, you know particular distance placed at a particular distance which is visible as two particular structures at different distances right that is what the resolution so basically the resolution everybody is aware of with the help of the you know the mobile cameras right good resolution helps you to see and it's not very pixelated right so you can make out details better so that is what uh, is the same thing which translates even in ultrasound while performing the ultrasound that is with the help of the wave that is the frequency so higher frequency we have good resolution here you can see when you are using the low frequency probe that the penetration may be good but the there is overlap of these two images this crowding of those two structures of interest right so coming to wavelength again is the distance between identical points in adjacent cycles of a waveform for waveform that is you can see the peaks and the troughs 
the highest point of the peak between the adjacent uh, the two waves is nothing but the wavelength or it can be between the two the troughs as well all right so as i mentioned higher frequency has shorter wavelength lower frequency has longer wavelength so coming to certain other factors like acoustic velocity it is the speed at which the sound wave travels through a medium so let's see the different mediums over here and focusing on the bone so the bone you can see the ultrasound speed is very high right but bone and air are kind of uh, you know enemies while we scan when we do the ultrasound scan but again they are also important landmarks as well for us so in air you can see it is 300 and in fact it is a little more very similar to the soft tissue so these things will help you to understand why do we get certain artifacts as we are performing the ultrasound scan so ultrasound tissue interaction so what happens to the ultrasound waves as it passes through the various tissues so the commonest thing what happens is energy loss so it's basically an energy right which is produced so there is loss of that now why there is loss okay and that term is nothing but attenuation okay so as the ultrasound beam travels through these tissue layers the amplitude of the original signal becomes attenuated as the depth of penetration increases so that means there is energy loss now let's see why that loss happens it happens because of three things that is because of absorption reflection and refraction refraction sorry so now what is this absorption so more 80% of attenuation is because of absorption okay so there is a minimal amount of heat which is produced which gets absorbed but we are not talking about the heat over here we are talking about the ultrasound energy per se the uh, the ultrasound waves what they produce they get sequentially they are absorbed finally with the tissues okay so that gets us to the attenuation coefficient that means different tissues have different absorption capacities okay that is uh, determined as the attenuation coefficient that is decibel per centimeter at 1 megahertz okay so you can see that water has the lowest attenuation coefficient okay and bone has the maximum co attenuation coefficient okay so the absorption is very much in the bone and very less in water so this we can see that if you have uh, of course, we have attended a lot of workshops where you've seen the water phantom, right? So there you are able to see the structures very well, right? So why is that happening? Because there is no absorption of this ultrasound waves because the coefficient is very less and we are able to see the structures as it is, right? So the degree of attenuation also varies directly with the frequency of the ultrasound wave. So higher frequency we know that the penetration is low so as the frequency increases the absorption coefficient also attenuation portion coefficient is higher thus limiting the tissue penetration so the obvious thing uh, the opposite thing is true for the low frequency so with low frequency is associated with less tissue attenuation less absorption so it can go and it, it can penetrate into deeper tissues, all right? So, which is uh, displayed in this uh, images over here. So, the intended target is over here. So, with the help of a, say, that means it must be way below four centimeters. So, if it is, if you are using a linear probe, which is a high frequency probe, it will get attenuated at its level and you'll not be able to visualize the structure, right? So I, Opposite, if you use the curvy linear probe, which is a low frequency probe, the penetration is better and we are able to visualize it. All right. Okay. But when it comes to resolution, you know that the high frequency offers us good resolution, whereas the uh, low frequency offers us poor resolution. That is what is displayed in this particular images. Where there are three intended structures to be scanned and to be visualized so with a high frequency but mind you out of these three two are at the 
at uh, one depth and then the third one is deeper to that so with the help of high frequency we are able to scan only the ones which are superficial okay whereas with the help of low frequency in the low frequency waves we are able to scan all three but they are crowded okay so the resolution is bad but the depth perception is better now how to overcome this attenuation 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 which we spoke about that is the absorption okay so we have to amplify the signal intensity of the returning echo that is why if we, on the especially on the stand alone machines we have seen this is the very commonest array of switches what you have seen right so this is the tgc is called as tgc nothing but time gain compensation that goes to say that these levels correspond to the levels in the display image okay from superficial to deep okay so if you are not able to see certain certain things in the at the depth we will be toggling this uh, particular button either to the left or to the right right so that we are adjusting to selectively amplify the weaker signals returning from the deeper structures okay so increases the gain of the reflected signals with increasing time from the transmitted pulse so from the source it has come here and it is sorry yeah it, it, one minute okay so so right now you can see that you are not able to visualize anything at this depth over here so we need to toggle this screen to the maximum gain so as when you when you do that again we are able to see this portion of the image okay so accordingly at different depths we can control the gain okay so another uh, part of attenuation that is absorption what happens to the ultrasound waves it gets reflected so the two kinds of reflection are scatter reflection and specular reflection this is to, to the are uh, based on what surface what kind of surface the ultrasound encounters as it passes through the tissues now again the extent of reflection is determined by a difference in acoustic impedance of the two tissues at the interface the degree of impedance mismatch is important now how to understand impedance so impedance you must have learned in high school that is nothing but it's a resistance so it's a resistance which is offered to the passage of this particular wave called as acoustic impedance which is nothing but the res resistance of a tissue to the passage of ultrasound higher the degree of impedance mismatch mismatch the greater amount of reflection remember it is a degree of mismatch so we have to keep in mind the acoustic impedance of both the tissues okay so for example air has an acoustic impedance least acoustic impedance right that means it doesn't offer any resistance okay whereas bone you can see it is 7.8 that offers the highest resistance to the passage of ultrasound so this is a very important picture again we commonly use the jelly right so now why do we need jelly and why can't we just keep the probe place the probe on the tissue and just proceed with scanning because of the difference between the acoustic impedances of the two tissues which will be very high because air has very less acoustic impedance so when the Uh, difference mismatch is very high there there will be reflection of all the ultrasound waves and it will not go into the tissue which you have uh, uh, area which we are interested in scanning so that is where the jelly uh, what we do it negates this acoustic impedance and that is how it helps in uh, the passage of the ultrasound waves into the area of interest the tissue of interest okay so coming to that uh, we are talking about reflection that occurs from the this is particular reflection this specular reflection occurs from the smooth surface that could be a block needle or facial sheets or the diaphragm the transmitted waves are reflected in a single direction okay this is again an important uh, image where they have displayed the probe and what all happens to the ultrasound beam at the various depths and depending on various structures it uh kind of negotiates in the way so you can see that it, when it when the ultrasound that's a it comes and uh, it it uh, encounters the artery 
when the vessels which is not a very or you can say visceral surfaces there is reflection in all uh, all direction that is the scattered reflection or if it is a uh, in the blood vessel that is in the blood vessel there is least resistance right so most of it gets passed through there is hardly any reflection okay and c when it encounters a nerve so because again difference of the acoustic impedance there is angulation of the transmitted beam right so this is nothing but the refraction happening over here and when it encounters something like a smooth surface like here example it is the needle the block needle smooth surface of the block needle it gets rapidly reflected at the at the smooth surface that is the specular reflection which is happening over there okay so scatter reflection when injury uncounts and enters uh, interface that is not perfectly smooth like the surface of the visceral organs the the incident uh, comes in and because of the concerations or because of the multiple directions of reflection it gets scattered in all directions so what happens when it scatters in different directions the reflected the echo with echo signal will be weak okay so that will lead to the weak amplitudes at the reception so we have to again toggle the tgc and to you have to manipulate so that we overcome this kind of uh phenomena which are occurring okay but mind you these kind of reflection this pattern of reflection also has diagnostic information in medical ultrasound imaging especially uh, while scanning the abdomen or uh, the lung uh, the thorax so refraction when an ultrasound wave contacts the interface between two media with different propagation velocities which is again determined by the impedance the acoustic impedance of the particular tissue the ultrasound wave is refracted or bent depending upon the difference in the velocities so one particular tissue is fat which causes considerable refraction and image distortion okay so what kind of image distortion we will be seeing okay so coming to the things which we actually use which we actually see so so far we have seen things we have not seen like uh, different phenomena different velocities different imp impedances right so what we actually use are the different uh, probes here we have the linear probes and the curvy linear probes right so this wave pattern is nothing but the a uh, beam which is emitted by a single crystal so when it's combined you will get the full fledged beam of ultrasound the ultrasound beam okay so the linear ones can be from 6 to 13 megahertz or 5 to 10 megahertz or even 6 to 13 okay you can choose a uh, let's say the frequency in between or the entire uh, from 5 to 15 or 20 hertz and then you can see the curvy linear uh, uh, probe which has the low frequency from 2 to 5 megahertz okay and its various applications depending upon the depth of the structure right so as you can see it's a very superficial structure the mostly the brachial plexus where the linear probe is used and then the curvy linear with the fashion of the, the way the ultrasound beam in a curved fashion that causes the crowding of the structures which we intend to target because of the poor resolution and where you can see on the left hand side we have a very good anatomical picture of the structure that is the good resolution which is offered by the higher frequency probe there are the various anatomical planes where we will be scanning on the human body and which help us to also intend and plan our placement of the probe as well and the needling direction so coming to the different two important views that is the long axis view and a short axis view. so here you can see the intended structure is a brachial plexus and the nerves are oriented in this fashion so when you place the when the when the ultrasound beam is perpendicular to that that becomes the short axis view and when you toggle again when you turn it to 90 degrees you will get the long axis view of the intended structure okay so out of plane in in plane is based on the orientation of the needle with respect to the probe okay so if you are going along the plane of the beam that is called as in plane 
and if you are placing the needle perpendicular to the beam it is out of plane so as you can see in in plane which is actually advised so that we can see the entire shaft of the needle and most importantly the tip of the needle okay while we are doing the injections and the disadvantage in out of plane that you can only make out as a single dot where we cannot say whether it is actually visualizing the shaft or the needle tip okay so each of this has its own clinical applications based on the site of or uh, interest okay so the same thing in a diagrammatic view and it's very important to stay at the center okay any because you know that the slice is like thickness of your debit card or a credit card right if you, if you see that that's the thickness of the beam so if you are any even 1 mm out of it you will be not be visualizing like this the entire shaft will not be visualized so this is the importance of today's class that how and where and how can you produce that precision okay so you have to stay at the, stay at the very you have to stay be very parallel to the particular plane of the ultrasound so coming to the image so transducer waits to receive the returning wave that is nothing but the echo echo machine you say that that's the echo after each pulsed wave so the transducer then transforms this mechanical energy into an electrical signal which is processed and displayed on the image as an image on the screen okay so based on that echogenicity we have terminologies like anechoic hypoechoic and hyperechoic okay so the ultrasound machines convert these echoes received by the transducer into visible dots which form the anatomical image on the ultrasound screen was to say that each particular structure what you see on this entire image is a dot okay that those dots when combined will give you the anatomical image okay and the brightness of each dot corresponds to the echo strength right so uh, on the based on that we have the uh, different echo density which i'll explain later so this image can be displayed in a number of modes that is the amplitude mode the b mode that's a brightness mode and the motion mode we are currently using this brightness mode now there are certain clinical applications for amplitude uh, a mode which is only in case of in uh, ophthalmology okay so very briefly to explain how it functions so the intended structure as you can see is this red circle okay and here we have placed the uh, the probe or the source of the uh, ultrasound and you have started the uh, scan right so the transducer cell sends a single impulse of the ultrasound into the medium and waits for the return signal so when it encounters this particular structure there will be one spike and when it passes through the medium and encounters this aspect of the structure there will be another spike okay this is what i spoke about so initially in time the first spike will be seen here and then afterwards there are no spikes and then the second spike when it uh, encounters this particular structure okay the height of the bump is called amplitude okay so based on the distance between the echo spikes they uh, can be calculated by dividing the speed of the ultrasound in the tissue by half the elapsed time so basically it will give you the length finally you'll be only to make out the length so it is used as a scan in ophthalmology to weigh the diameter okay so coming to the most common mode what we use that is the brightness that's the b mode so the echo returns to the transducer but there are it's the amplitude which is represented by the degree of brightness okay so the brightness we are not interested in the spike okay it will be displayed as a dot so in this elapsed time you can see that one this dot corresponds to this particular area of the scan and then as the time elapses elapses you will get only a dot when it encounters this particular structure right this that the other end so finally that was uh, uh, mind you that was a single uh, piezoelectric crystal right so when we use an array a linear array of 100 to 300 piezoelectric elements you can see that they are you know sending each one is sending its own impulse uh, pulses 
uh, the rays and finally when you reconstruct it you will be getting the reconstructed dot displayed as a brightness which looks circular very similar to the structure which is intended so this is how the image is formed okay so based on echogenicity we have hyperechoic hypoechoic and anechoic so hyperechoic strong specular reflections give rise to bright dots these are these appear as very bright structures in the in the scan uh, in the screen so those are called as hyperechoic structures and uh, hypoechoic they'll be weaker diffuse reflections produce as gray dots uh, especially like you know the gallbladder what you seen over here and then anechoic anechoic is completely black right so usually the vascular structures because they do not produce any reflection they are seen as anechoic structures right so the tissue and the ultrasound image veins and the vascular structures they both are anechoic but the arteries of course are pulsatile and the veins are compressible fat is usually hypoechoic with the regular hyperechoic lines muscles are heterogeneous there are a mixture of hyperechoic lines within hypoechoic tissue in the background tendons predominantly hyperechoic could be a technical artifact because of the placement of the probe onto them onto the structure they can have technical artifacts otherwise they are predominantly hyperechoic bone hyperechoic lines with the hypoechoic shadow because it doesn't let any uh, rays pass through it so beyond the bone we can't visualize anything right because most of the ultrasound waves are reflected completely nerves nerves are hyperechoic or hypoechoic and they could have technical artifacts which can they can appear as hypoechoic so coming to the different uh, types of resolution okay again we have axial resolution lateral resolution and temporal resolution okay which these determine the degree of image clarity and it is the it refers to the ultrasound machine's ability to distinguish one object from another okay so here you can see that you have, uh, there are two intended structures along the axis of the ultrasound beam right that means they are in different depths so between if a a particular frequency is able to see these two structures differently at different depths then that is a good resolution so that resolution is nothing but the axial resolution okay so the higher frequency wave with a short pulse length will lead a better axial resolution than a low frequency wave basically you know that the resolution is better in high frequency now lateral resolution they are at the same depth but adjacently placed so it has to visualize these two structures as adjacently placed right so uh, this is two objects lying beside perpendicular to the ultrasound beam so here we saw they are along the parallel to the ultrasound beam here there it, it is perpendicularly placed okay so directly related to the transverse beam width inversely related to the ultrasound frequency again goes to say that a uh, higher the frequency better is the resolution lower the frequency poor is the resolution okay so coming to temporal resolution so ability to accurately locate the position of moving structures at a particular instant of time so now how to make this understand is simple gps what we use in our day to day life right the google maps so we need to have a continuous uh, display of the location right if we if, say if you want to move from you are moving from point a to point b all the way from a to b we need to have that uh, information of the location right then only we can get the map so imagine when you start from a there is a lag in your internet or your bandwidth there is a lag so finally when you reach b you would have reached from a to b but we do not know in what path you do not know the trajectory right so that is what is uh, sim uh, very similar in temporal resolution in during the ultrasound scan that means so for example when we as we are uh, passing the needle at every second we should have the information where the needle tip is right so that depends upon the refresh that is the bandwidth okay so again that is de determined by the bandwidth as well as the frame rate so only if the frame rate is good and high you can get the continuous information of where the needle tip is right so that is nothing but the temporal resolution
so ability to accurately locate the position of moving structures at particular instants of time the mode which is not very much used for us useful for us uh, most in uh, most usually in uh, the cardiology department doppler mode yes again which uh, uh, detects the change in frequency or wavelength of a sound wave resulting from relative motion between the sound source and the sound receiver again the commonest example that you know you're standing at a point and then the ambulance moves past you right so as it is approaching from a further distant when it is far in the the sound even though the source the the, the bell or the alarm on the ambulance emits the sound in the same frequency but since it is far from you you can hear it as it okay there is a, a the the pitch is low but as it passes you closer to you you can hear it is sounding louder and again as it passes again uh, i mean away from you the sound the sound said the pitch is low okay so this is a relative change which is actually not there right it is only because the distance between the sound source and the sound receiver okay so that is nothing but the uh, the doppler change the shift in the frequency the doppler shift so that is uh, adopted in, in this particular uh, machines so especially while we are uh, scanning for the blood vessels so to calculate the blood flow velocity also for the direction of blood flow basically in our uh, in our clinical um, in, uh, scenarios to know whether it is a uh, blood vessel or not and if if yes to find out whether it's an artery or a vein if it is really needed okay so color doppler produces a colored map of doppler shift superimposed onto the b mode image so it combines both the properties of the ultrasound and finally you will it will display as red or blue so red is towards the probe and blue is away from the probe basically in acetic as i said presence of and the nature of the blood vessels in the area of interest which is very important when you do a, we should always do a scout scan prior to uh, attempting any injections or any procedure so it, was, it can also be converted audible frequencies or a microphone again towards the source it will sound louder away from the source it will be silent right so power doppler so we do see this particular button okay one another knob on our machines why is it used because in in case of low flow low flow uh, vessels to detect the flow in them it is much more sensitive than a color doppler okay but doesn't indicate the flow direction or velocity but just tells you that whether there is any low flow detection also happening in the area of interest pulse wave doppler again not much of use very very important artifacts so something seen on the ultrasound image that doesn't exist in reality okay so display distortions or errors that may adversely affect image interpretation or acquisition so this is again user dependent that means you as a person or a clinician scanning is also responsible for certain artifacts and how to avoid them that is what is will be very important to be known from the further slides right because it can confuse the examiner anatomic artifacts tissue structures is a normal or aberrant may resemble the target nerve thus mislead the operator into pursuing the wrong target so common solutions to all pitfall errors are to trace the target nerve along the expected anatomical course use a peripheral nerve stimulator on an adjunct to confirm target's identity in case of a nerve the tom more talking about right so especially you can see uh, this in case of the at the level of the carpal tunnel right so this is at the carpal tunnel where you can see a hyperechoic structures within which there are certain hypoechoic structures right so this is one particular uh, type of structure what you are seeing then you are seeing another structure which is again more of hypoechoic but hy uh, displaying hyperechoic lines between them so now we know that this probably is a nerve and this is a muscle but uh, even the tendons have the similar kind of echogenicity so at the carpal tunnel it is always advised that you go more proximal so if it is a tendon it becomes a muscle belly okay which is displayed which will look exactly like this all right if it is a nerve it will stay as a nerve which is again hyperechoic with hypoechoic structures with inside it right another artifact 
or which causes an artifact or a particular principle which causes an artifact is anisotropy. So this anisotropy can be explained in this image one and image two. So in image one, we have placed the transducer in a particular angle and the structure beneath it. Say, imagine this is a nerve, right? So between the two images, the nerve is better seen visualized in this particular image. Why? Because we have placed the beam in such a way that it is exactly perpendicular to the structure so that we are trying to achieve almost complete reflection of the waves, uh, the echo waves after it is uh, encounters that particular structure at that particular depth. So it comes and goes back. So whereas in this particular image, you can see that even though superficially we are at the same level, at, in, at the depth, we are not able to visualize that particular structure because of the angle. So in this particular angle, the waves hit the structure and they get reflected, but they are not received by the probe. Okay. So accordingly, we tilt the probe and to adjust so that the reflect, we get almost complete reflection and the visualization of the structure is better. So this is nothing but anisotropy, right? Because a hyperechoic structure can be visualized as a hypoechoic structure or a, a not as a hyperechoic structure in this particular instance, right? So we have to accordingly adjust to visualize the structures. What we are doing? Finally, adjusting the echo wave so that it is completely uh, received back by the probe. So other certain artifacts like overgain and undergain artifacts. So this is avoided by the TGC, that is the time gain compensation. So as you can see, these two, both the images are not adequate. Right, because this is at the interscalian level, where we are actually our structures of interest are over here, the C6, the C5, C6, C7 nerve roots. Right, so you know that when it comes to nerves, as more proximal the nerves are, they are very more hypoechoic with the just a hyperechoic rim. When they become peripheral nerves, they will have the recogenicity changes that they are hyperechoic structure with hypoechoic. Uh, smaller structures within with certain hyperechoic structures as well. They'll have mixed echogenicity, right? So in these, both these two images, we are not able to visualize that, okay? So this is a case of overgain and this is a case of undergain, right? So with the help of the gain uh, button, which is sometimes a single button or as we saw in the TGC, depending upon the depth, we can toggle those buttons to get the adequate gain to visualize these particular structures. Right. So what is the shadowing or attenuation artifact? Attenuation, you know, is its absorption. So total reflection of the beam from a structure of high attenuation coefficient or total absorption. Example is commonest is the bone. Right. So when you when you encounter a bony surface, we can see it is a, it is very bright in uh, appearance, hyperechoic, but beneath that we are not able to visualize anything. That is the uh, attenuation shadow, all right? Because completely the waves get reflected and you're not able to visualize anything in the beyond the bone, right? What is this acoustic artifact, which is called as post, actually post acoustic enhancement. So in this structure, in this particular image, you can see that there is an anechoic structure and below that, beneath that, you can see something, the, there's a brightness, right? Hyperechoic. So, is that structural real? No. So why what why this is happening? Because this is a uh, an, uh, what is it? Uh, it's a blood vessel. It allows the ultrasound waves to completely pass through it, right? And then get, they get reflected. So this area, the signal's intensity is more, thus resulting in the hyperechogenicity of that portion. Okay. Very commonly seen beyond the blood vessels, major blood vessels or cysts. Okay. So mirror artifact. Again, when it encounters a very smooth surface like a pleura, uh, what happens is, again, uh, the, uh, the acoustic wave get, you can see here, it encounters the smooth surface, gets reflected on that particular uh, structure and goes back. So finally, there is a mirroring of the structure. Most commonly encountered in uh, the supraclavicular brachial plexus where there's a pleura, you can see that there's a mirroring of the blood vessels. 
So another important artifact, reverberation artifact. Okay, it occurs when the ultrasound beam encounters two strong parallel reflectors. Okay, so in this image, you can see that artifact that there is a mm, the needle, so which is the smooth, strong parallel reflector. So the uh, what happens is it the, the echo waves are reflected over here at different depths, and you can see that this there is reverberation of the. It appears that there is reverberation of the needle. Okay. So, how can you improve this? So, instead of it, may, it will not cause much of a issue, but can be changed by changing the angle of intonation so that the reverberation between the strong parallel reflectors cannot occur. Okay. So, maybe if you tilt this needle in, in this particular fashion, but again, it uh, uh, depends on where our area of interest lies. It, as I said, doesn't affect the scan much, but it's just an artifact which is observed. Okay. Two types of such artifacts if you are the comet tail artifact and ring down artifact, which have uh, clinical significance mostly in, when you do a lung scan. Okay. Another important bionic uh, artifact that is again uh, when it encounters tissue, uh, tissue like which have two di uh, varying difference of acoustic impedance, right? Example is fat, very commonly seen when you do a posterior, uh, what is this, a popliteal uh, fossa static nerve block. As the needle passes through and encounters fat tissue, you can see that the tip of the needle appears as if, as if it is bent. Okay. So this is the bayonet artifact, what is seen. So coming to the last part. That is the novelty. Again, you know that the gain will change the amount of white, black, and gray on the image. Helps us to uh, distinguish the structures on the screen. If it is uh, under gain or over gain, uh, accordingly, we will be changing that. Focus helps to improve the visualization of the target structure. And more important, the mode of scanning, whether it's general mode or nerve or vascular mode. Depth settings to see the deeper structures. Okay. So ideally, depth should be set about one centimeter deeper than the target of interest okay then probe orientation and the, the marker which is usually seen on the screen accordingly on the marker we can uh, what side of the image are we visualizing can be known all trying to have orientation marker that corresponds to the marker on the screen so coming to the manipulation probe manipulation which is called as the mnemonic is p a r t okay so p stands for pressure a for alignment R for rotation and T for tilt. Okay. So alignment is from one part to the other. You have changed the position. It's like a, you're translating it, moving it, right? Whereas from, from the at the from a particular point, you're trying to, to move it, that is rotation. Again, you from that particular point, if you're trying to tilt, is the tilt and the pressure. What is missing is the pressure. Pressure is also very important, or you could be occluding certain vessels with your pressure and uh, just uh, getting a you know misinterpretation of the image okay then other futuristic application already used actually the 3d ultrasound okay and the 4d ultrasound and then there are advanced uh, tracking systems of the needle tip okay certain uh, uh, applications which help you to exactly uh, target and visualize the needle tip that is the tracking uh, system Okay. Then the newer uh, aspects in ultrasound currently, like the robotics. Okay. And the biosafety. As I said initially, they, it produces wave, uh, heat, right? So, but the thermal index and the mechanical index, they suggest that it is not hazardous to the uh, tissue. Okay. That's all. Thank you.